Well, good morning. Welcome to uh, another beautiful day here in the North Georgia mountains and uh, another Sunday morning version of Jesus and Jeans Worship at the Cottage. We are very honored to have you here with us today, especially if you're joining us uh, via the internet. Uh, we stream our, our services every week and uh, um, during the storm and everything that we've been through, man, we've still been able to use the technology that we have to, to get out and so we're very, very thankful for that. And uh, uh, we've got some folks that are, we have the haves and the have-nots here today. <laughs> At least one there are those who have power and there are some who still have not any power. <laughs> It ain't funny. And it ain't funny. <laughs> oh, man. We uh, got a couple of birthdays. Steve Hood, his birthday today, and we're, we're glad to have him here with us. All right. He's run out of fours. That's what I heard. <laughs> and uh, Philip Black, uh, that, uh, Pip and Beth, they're still without power as well, as, as, so, as many of you are. And... Uh, I think today is, is Pip's birthday, so we want to wish them both a very happy birthday. Happy birthday, y'all. We're going to continue in a, a series that I started several weeks ago. It's, it's called A Christian's Heart. And uh, today we're, we're going to be in the, in the book of Isaiah and in the Old Testament. And uh, we're going to be in chapter 53. Uh, Great, great chapter in the Bible, and uh, we're going to be taking a look at some of the scriptures there, but before we do, we're going to sing a little bit. Everybody got their praise and worship voice on? And... <clears throat> yeah. All right, I'm going to let y'all do most of the singing today because I've been on this marathon gig thing this weekend, and uh... it's a great old hymn. Sure, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. There is salvation, purchase of God. Born of the Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song. Submission, perfect divine, visions of rapture, not first on my side. Angels descending, bring from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song. Savior on the long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission. All is at rest. I am my Savior. I'm happy and glad. Watching the Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Sing the chorus again. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior. Praising my Savior all the day long. 
Amen. coming to your presence this morning with praise and thanksgiving to say thank you for a, another day to walk this sod. We pray, Father, that in everything we do and say here today that it will bring you glory, that it will be for our benefit. As your word permeates our spirits, Lord, we pray that it will not only just tickle our ears, but it would just impregnate our hearts. And that we would just be filled with your spirit. That we might be able to live different lives. We pray uh, for one of our sisters uh, from Paradise Valley, Becca. We, we lift her in prayer today, God, because... Um, She's suffering through some illness that they're not sure exactly what's going on. And, but we know, Father, and trust you uh, knowing that you do know what's going on and nothing escapes you. So we pray today as we talk about you as the great physician, Lord, that you would bring healing uh, to her body. We love you, Lord. We thank you for every single day that you give us. We thank you for the love that you share with us on a regular, consistent basis. We ask your blessings today in the wonderful name of your Son, Jesus. And all God's children said, Amen. 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 Well, again, we are going to continue in, um, in our series today, and I, I want us to take a look at some scriptures from uh, Isaiah 53. And we're going to begin with uh, verse 2, and we're going to go through uh, verse 5. These are, are very important scriptures because throughout the Bible, whether you're reading in the book of Genesis, and, and I tell people from Genesis to maps, you know what maps is? Those are the little maps in the back of your Bible. <laughs> and so from Genesis to maps, it's, it's all about Jesus. Everything in Scripture points the way to know Him. 
to get connected with Him. And these scriptures in the book of Isaiah in chapter 53 are a, a foretaste, a prophecy of the coming Messiah. And they're very important to us today as believers that throughout my life I've had spiritual markers that I've been able to look back over and see what God was doing in my life when I'm going through a, a particular difficult time in my life. And these types of prophecies are similar in, in, in the sense that they give us a picture of what God was doing from the very, very beginning of time. And so as we read through these scriptures, I want you to be able to, you know, to try to grasp that, that, you know, this is just not happenstance. This is not just, you know, an ethereal, you know, belief or understanding. God is very, very determined in his purpose for our will and our life. And he had a plan for us, and it was always to know his son, Jesus. So we're going to begin reading, and, and this is a description of Christ that is so humbling to me when, when I think of all that Jesus has done for me personally. And it was when I was reading through these scriptures, it just almost it just brings tears to my eyes and, and, and very deep emotions because of how much Christ has done for each one of us. I read this from the NIV, but because these words are so small, I, I took the liberty of putting them on my tablet so I could expand them a little bit. <laughs> this says this in Isaiah 53, beginning in verse 2. He says, He grew up before Him. He grew up before God. He grew up before Him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised. And we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on Him. And by His wounds, we are healed. <coughs> now, in our series on the heart of a, a Christian, we've been looking at those qualities that every Christian needs and should have. Today is no exception. In fact, it's vital in our ability to share the, the good news of Jesus Christ with the world around us. You see, the overall call that we've been given is to be like Christ, to be made into the image of Christ. That is the work of the Holy Spirit working on us from the inside out. And so... We are to follow Him. That's what Jesus said to us. Only two words, pretty easy. Follow me. Do I need to explain that to anybody? <laughs> and that's what He said, follow me. And so we are to follow Him and also the example He lays out for us. And this means that we need to be what is the understanding of a wounded healer. This picture of Christ that we just read in, in Isaiah is a picture of what they call a wounded healer like Christ who identifies with human pain and suffering, becoming a channel for healing. Early
early on in my ministry, I had been in ministry for a couple of years, and I got really caught up in the work of ministry. I was working a lot of hours on a weekly basis, and I was doing all kinds of good things. I was going to Bible studies in the morning with our staff, and I was counseling and, and working with you know the congregation that we had. I was leading worship. I was teaching. I was, I was doing all these things, and I was really busy. And I thought, man, I'm, I'm doing all this great work for, for Christ. And, you know, so I thought, man, finally I have fulfilled my potential right up to the point that when I turn uh, 50, Steve, <laughs> I wasn't going to say that, but since I brought it up. <laughs> and when I turned 50, I started to feel like the wheels were coming off of the ministry that I was involved in, my own personal ministry. And it was through this realization that I started to, to realize, man, Teddy, you got a problem. You know, the wheels are coming off. And what happened in my life is that I lost my coping skills of being able to cope with the pressures of doing ministry. And so I went to see a, a counselor. And I started working with this counselor. And this counselor said, Teddy, here's your problem. You're depressed. You're suffering from depression. And in my arrogance and, and you know, not understanding depression, I said, there's no way I can be depressed. I'm too busy. I don't have time to be depressed. Besides, depression is a woman's thing. I, men don't get depressed. <laughs> I really said that. <laughs> and so he gave me a book to read and it was from a, a Dutch Catholic priest by the name of Henri Nguyen the book was called The Wounded Healer and what God brought me through in that time in that period was to come to know, to get rid of myself, to get out of the way of God and, and deal with my own ego. And remember what ego stands for, edging, edging God out. <clears throat> and it was dealing with my own ego that I began to understand my own woundedness. That while I had been so busy doing all these good things for Jesus, there was a woundedness in me that I had not dealt with. And God, at the wonderful age of 50, said, Teddy, it's time for you to peel back the layers of the onion. And we're going to take a look inside there. And I'm fixing to take you on a journey that you haven't been before. But when you come through this journey, you're going to understand more about who you are and what I've called you to do. And what I've called you to do is not about being busy. So he, he doesn't need our, our abilities all the time. He needs our availability. That we're just available to him to do whatever he calls us to do. And so today, I want to. I'm taking some uh, some references from this book, The Wounded Healer, and I want to share them with you as we go through what it means to have a wounded healer's heart. Henri Nguyen said this. He says, "Experience tells us that we can only love because we are born." out of love that we can only give because our life is a gift and that we can only make others feel uh, we can only make others free because we are set free by him whose heart is greater than ours 
When we have found the anchor places, very important phrase there. When we have found the anchor places for our lives in our own center, we can be free to let others enter into the space created for them and allow them to dance their own dance, to sing their own song, and to speak their own language without fear. That was a very liberating part of this book for me to read because I'm one of those guys that used to go, well, well what you ought to do? Yeah, I like you, but what you ought to do, and see, there's some things in you that I don't like, and I think you ought to change, and the whole world would just do everything that I wanted them to do. It'd be a whole lot better place to live in. <laughs> How's that working for you? Because <laughs> that was just a lie that I bought into. But Henri Nguyen opened up the scriptures through these writings in me, because here's, here's the reality. Christ, through His brokenness and wounds, heals our pains and binds up our wounds. His power to heal is off the chain. It is greater than all the medicines combined. His ability to, ability to speak peace into our hearts is greater than whatever peace the world can give. And His power brings joy that is greater than anything this world can ever offer. I don't care how much stuff you have. There is no greater joy than the joy of the Lord because the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. And compassion and caring is at the heart of God. Therefore, it needs to be a, a core ingredient of our own hearts. Healing is needed on many levels today. You don't have to look very far around you to understand and see people who are emotionally or physically wounded. Although they've become pretty adept at hiding it. You know the phrase that I use, how, hey, how you doing? I'm fine. <laughs> I went by the dairy place during the storm the other day, and the, uh, there's a big dairy place that has the ice cream out on 129, you know where that is? Yeah. So that big cow was standing in the, that stands in the front was laying over on its side. <laughs> and I wanted to go in there and take a picture of this and just, you know, put it up here on the screen going, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> oh yeah? <laughs> oh, that was so funny. <laughs> but I digress. <laughs> but here, here's a reality game. So many of us struggle with loneliness and, and despair, disappointment, discouragement, depression, aggression. All are symptoms of deep woundedness that have never truly been healed. And while Jesus came to heal all of our diseases, He has called those who are His people to be those healers as well. Even though we've been wounded ourselves. Now, we don't, you know... I'm not much on faith healing. I'm not going to come over there and slap you on the forehead, you know, and you be healed, you know. <clears throat> but what I can do is I can point you to Jesus. That I know the, the, the healer. I know the great physician. I know the real healer in my life. The ultimate wounded healer. And the Lord reveals this about this coming Messiah in these scriptures that we read in Isaiah 53. <clears throat> From the King James, uh, the new King, I call it the new King Jimmy, but <clears throat> he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, 
we are healed. Jesus is the ultimate wounded healer. And as He walked upon this earth, He healed people of their hurts and, and their diseases. He healed them not only physically, He healed them also emotionally and spiritually. Mark 1.34 says, Then He healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. We're also told of this coming Messiah that He would heal those who are broken hearted. Isaiah 61, 1. The very, this is a, the very scriptural passage that Jesus used to describe His own ministry while on, on this earth. That He came to heal the broken hearted. And so, why did Jesus have to become wounded in order to heal? <coughs> The reason is so that He can sympathize and help us through whatever we're going through. And what this mean, it means to each one of us as believers is that we don't have to face any situation, any amount of pain, any amount of abuse, any amount of grief, any amount of doubt or fear. We don't ever have to face it alone. In the book of Hebrews it says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. That's in Hebrews 4.15. So how else could Jesus have been that perfect substitute, that perfect sacrifice for us without going through it Himself? Jesus took on the form of a, a human being, one with all the physical limitations of being the, a human, and He chose, He chose to suffer, feeling the same pain knowing the same grief and being hurt just like us. That's why y'all don't want me to be God. Because I wouldn't do that. That's just the kind of guy I am. But Jesus chose to suffer, to take on these pains. He was our wounded healer because he understood what it was like to be hated, to be despised, rejected, abused, and what it meant to be an outcast even amongst his own people. He is despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from Him. He was despised and we did not esteem Him. And on top of it all, He carried the sin and the sorrow of the whole world as He hung upon the cross. Taking our place. Dying a death that we all deserve because as it says in, in the book of Romans in chapter, sin, uh, chapter 6, that the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. And all of us have missed that mark. Would you agree? Yes. None of us bat a thousand. None of us are perfect. And so the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Jesus was beaten and bruised and deeply wounded so that He'd be able to heal us of sin, which is the most potent hurt of them all. 1 Peter 2.24 says it this way, He Himself bore our sins in His body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By His wounds, you have been healed. And so we are to come 
to our wounded healer, Jesus, to be healed of our wounds physically, emotionally, spiritually. And it's with this same heart, a wounded healer's heart, that He's called us to minister to all of those people that God continues to place in our, within our sphere of influence. <clears throat> And the reality is, is that if you don't take time to slow down enough, if you don't give God place that when somebody comes into your life and says something, if you're not listening with godly ears, if you're not looking through kingdom concepts of what God is doing around you, if life is just all about you and where you've got to go, and I need to get, well, i got two minutes, go ahead, share. <laughs> if you don't have time to sit down and look somebody in the eye, you're going to miss an opportunity to be used by God in a great, magnificent way. Some of the greatest blessings in my life were when I stopped for a moment to try to be a blessing to someone else and I walked away being blessed. And so as I look at this, there are several aspects that I wanted to share with you this morning of having a wounded healer's heart. The first aspect that I want to share with you is that a wounded healer has a heart of compassion. Andre Nguyen writes this. He says, Through compassion, it is possible to recognize that the craving for love that people feel resides also in our own hearts. That the cruelty the world knows all too well is also rooted in our own impulses. That through compassion, we also sense our hope for forgiveness in our friends' eyes. And our own hatred in their bitter mouths we also see that. We see our own hatred when we listen to someone kind of spit out their vitriol about whatever it is they're talking about. When they kill, we know that we could have done it. When they give life, we know that we can do the same. For a compassionate person, I want you to hear this. For a compassionate person, nothing human is alien. No joy, no sorrow, no way of living, no way of dying. I was playing a gig last night up at Lake Burton and this guy was... Tell me, he said, Teddy, he said, you know, my power's been out for all these days and everybody around me has power. And I finally called up the power company and man, I just let them have it. He said, man, I know you're a preacher and all that kind of stuff. But he said, I just got to tell you, man, you know, forgive me for doing this. He said, I just cussed them out. So there's nothing to forgive. I probably would have done the same thing. Because that's how human we all are. You see, when you have compassion, again, for a compassionate person, nothing human is alien. We're not surprised when people act who they are. I have no power to, to forgive anything. I can't fix myself. Much less try to fix someone else. I, I went bankrupt in that business. And I don't want to try to fix somebody. I want to live with you. I want to love you. I want to do life with you. I don't want to try to fix you. There's no apology to me, man. I'm sorry. Me too. In the seventh chapter of the Gospel of Luke, there's a very powerful scene, and I want you to capture this scene. 
Jesus was approaching the city of Nain where he encounters a, this large procession of mourners. And it's carrying the body of a mother's only son. And seeing her obvious grief, it says that Jesus had compassion on her. And he touched the coffin and said, Arise. And the young man sat up and began to speak. And the word compassion that's used is very telling and one that is instructive if we truly want to be followers of Christ. It says, while this word of, for having pity, feeling sympathy, that's what we, we think of. The word actually goes much deeper. It comes from the very bowels of a person. And it's referred to as the seat of emotions. And Jesus felt the pain and the anguish of that mother's loss way down in his guts. And having compassion for her, he met her need right there, right then. This was the very heart of Jesus. Whenever he saw a need, he, it says in the Bible that he had compassion. Like at the feeding of, five, of the 5,000 in Mark chapter 6 says, When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. This was part of Paul's recommendation for believers that the first thing they were to put on is compassion. In Colossians 3.12 it says, Therefore as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Every single day, God places people in our lives that are consumed with deep pain. Maybe a friend or a neighbor. Maybe they've had some, someone close to them pass away or an illness has struck. They have pain. They have physical pain. Both physical and emotional. And that pain is real. And what I believe that God is calling us to do is to stop being so busy with our own lives and respond to their need with this sort of from the bowels compassion. To get past, I'm fine. To really take an opportunity to share what some would call empathy. Who can we reach out to today? Who can we offer the compassion of Jesus to? We need to take a moment and slow down and pay attention to those who the Lord may be putting in our path. We're called to share in their feelings and their emotions as if they were our own. This leads me to the, the second aspect of a wounded healer's heart, and that is a heart of a giver. And usually when we think of this concept of giving, when that comes up, we think about our assets, of what we've got to, to give of our assets. And that's maybe we give to charities or maybe you give tithes and offerings. You don't hear, you give out of what you want to give. We don't ask you for anything. And we do that purposefully. We don't want your money. We want your heart. We look at how the people of God over the years have given willingly how God loves a cheerful giver. And while this should be at the heart of every Christian, this is not exactly the type of giving that we're, we're looking at when we look at the heart of a wounded healer. It's a heart that gives of itself to help others in need. Andre Nguyen in The Wounded Healer wrote, who can listen to a story of loneliness and despair without taking the risk of experiencing similar pains in his own heart and even losing his precious peace of mind? In short, who can take away suffering 
without entering it. As a wounded healer, Jesus gave of Himself to heal those who were likewise wounded and in need. And again, I go back to Isaiah's suffering servant passage. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon Him. And by His stripes, by His wounds, we are healed. Not only did Jesus give of Himself there upon the cross, but He also continued to give and healing those who came to Him. A beautiful story in the book of Mark in the first chapter, verses 40 and 41, it says, Now a leper came to Him, imploring Him, kneeling down to Him and saying to Him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. And then Jesus moved with compassion stretched out his hands and touched him and said to him, I am willing. Be clean. And while Jesus gave of himself, the Lord calls for us to do the same. We are to help heal the wounds of others with the same comfort and grace that God used in our healing process. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. It's such a, a giving heart that that the Lord Jesus pays attention to and blesses in, the, in His end times. This, this parable that He told, saying, He said, Assuredly, I say to you, in as much as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. A cup of water. Jesus said, you did it just a cup of cold water. You did it in my name. As if you were giving it to me. And when we honestly ask ourselves, which... This is a, another Andre Nguyen writer. Uh, uh, part of his book, yeah, quote. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> what would I do without you, dear? No telling. <laughs> True. <laughs> when we honestly ask ourselves which person in our lives means the most to us, we often find that it is those who instead of giving advice, solutions, or cures, have chosen rather to share our pain and touch our wounds with a warm and tender hand. The friend who can be silent with us in a moment of despair or confusion. Who can stay with us in an hour of grief and bereavement. Who can tolerate not knowing, not curing, not healing, and face with us the reality of our powerlessness. That is a friend who cares. And the final aspect of a, a wounded healer's heart is that it's also a heart of faith. Andre Nguyen writes about faith. He said it this way. He says, God is faithful to God's promises. Before you die, you will find acceptance and the love you crave. It will not come in the way you expect. It will not follow your needs and wishes. But it will fill your heart and satisfy your deepest desire. There is nothing to hold on but to this promise. <coughs> Cling to the naked promise in faith. Your faith 
will heal you. It was to Jesus, the wounded healer, that the woman with the issue of blood came and by faith reached out and touched the hem of his garment and was healed. And we know this because Jesus turned to her and said, your faith has healed you. That's in Matthew 9, 20 through 22. Jesus is the great physician. And not only does He heal our physical ailments, but He's the one that heals our sick souls. Jesus said, those who are well have no need of a physician. But those who are sick I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. It's in Luke 5, 31 and 32. There's a great story, a great picture of when John the Baptist was in prison. He sent two of his disciples to ask Jesus <clears throat> whether he was the coming one. Are you really the one? Now here's John the Baptist who entered, you know, ministered to Jesus, baptized Him, helped Jesus in the beginning of His ministry, who proclaimed the Messiah was coming to be baptized, to repent. He was a voice in the wilderness. And now here He is in prison dealing with His own mortality. And he's just kind of sitting there wondering. And I think it's just a wonderfully honest, pure question. Are you really the one? Has everything that I've done been worth it? And I love what Jesus, how he, respond, he responded. Jesus told the disciples, he said, go and tell John the things that you've seen and heard. The blind see. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised. The poor have the gospel preached to them. Yeah, John. I'm the one. And then Jesus said, And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. And he was basically saying, blessed are those who have faith in me. This must be our faith in Jesus, our, our great physician. As well as we, we come to him so that, that he can treat our wounds, especially the wounded souls, the spirit, that inner person within us. Having faith, therefore, in the great physician, we are able to finally follow His directions. On one occasion, Jesus said to the Pharisees, Why do you call Me Lord and do not the things which I say? And as, as we look at Jesus as our, our great physician, we could change this up a little bit and say, why do you call me your physician if you're not going to follow my instructions? You know, it's like going to the doctor. Doc, it hurts when I do this. Don't do that. <laughs> and the beauty of Jesus is that His instructions to us are literally that simple. We make it difficult because we want to take it back and own it ourselves. We want control of our lives. We want to have our ego pumped to say, well, I did this. <laughs> I. Well, when you spell sin, what's the middle letter? <laughs> there is no I in we. And God has called us as the family of God. To be a light, to be salt and light, to be healing. 
wounded healer's heart to one another. <clears throat> Our faith in a physician is valuable only if we'll follow his remedy. He's given us a whole book of prescriptions. It's a life manual. I wouldn't go work on my car. I wouldn't go work on anything without reading the instructions. I'm one of those weird guys. <laughs> I'll actually read the instructions. I'll actually ask for directions when I'm lost. <laughs> it's just weird. You know, I'll probably start going to recovery for that. So. <laughs> But this is it. He said, read it. Learn it. Apply it. It's pretty simple. And from Genesis to maps, you'll see me. I'll be there. Amen. I'll help you. I'll heal you. Paul saw this in the... Uh, as he observed this man, and he, as, as Paul looked at this man, he, he, he recognized that this man had the faith to be healed. And so he said with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped up and he walked. This was in the book of Acts. See, today doctors don't do house calls. Instead, we're, we're to go to their offices to receive the benefits of their treatment as we wait all day. <laughs> but it's essential for our recovery to be healed we must come to Christ Jesus said come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest but there is there were some even in Jesus day his own people who would not come and so Jesus says, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. In the wounded healer, Henri Nguyen retells a tale from ancient India. It's a story of four royal brothers and they decided each to master a special ability. Time went by and the brothers met to reveal what they had learned. The first one said, well, I have mastered a science by which I can take but a bone of some creature and create the flesh that goes with it. <clears throat> I, said the second, know how to grow a creature's skin and hair if there is flesh on its bones. The third said, I am able to create its limbs if I have flesh, the skin, and the hair. And I, concluded the fourth, know how to give life to that creature if its form is complete. Thereupon the brothers went into the jungle to find a bone so they could demonstrate their specialties. As fate would have it, the bone they found was a lion's. <laughs> and so one added flesh to the bone. The second grew hide and hair. The third completed it with matching limbs. And the fourth gave the lion life. Shaking its mane, the ferocious beast arose and jumped on his creators. He killed them all and vanished contentedly into the jungle. <clears throat> what I want you to get from this story is that we too have the capacity to create those things that can devour us. Jesus is the great physician. 
He is our wounded healer. And He is here to heal. Sometimes the hurt can go on for a very long time. It can be hidden in the, the deepest recesses of our soul and heart. Because we're, we're hoping that somehow we can forget it. Or we can sweep it far enough under the rug that eventually it'll just go away. But it just keeps coming back. It's the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> It's made Dr. Phil, Phil a very you know, famous guy with just one phrase. How's that working for you? And the reality is, is that we can't find the peace that we need. There's one thing I want you to know is that God is greater than the hurt and the sorrow. No matter how heavy the load or how burdened down you ever may feel or how overwhelmed you are, Jesus understands our grief. And He's able to take it and carry it along with us in this process of growth and maturity as we give Him place in our lives. Does that make sense? Some things that I've, I've personally learned as I, I walk through this part of understanding a wounded healer's heart, understanding my own depression. See, the depression was just a symptom. There were deeper things in my life that had happened that I never dealt with. I never asked for forgiveness for that I never offered forgiveness for. And I tell you, there are things in my life that are, are, are in deep, dark places. <coughs> And it was only coming through this experience that I actually learned how to deal with it. And that God wanted me to deal with it. He truly wanted to set this captive free. That was His plan. I just went kicking and screaming and scratching. And, and I was a tough nut to crack. But the things that I've personally learned in my relationship with Jesus is that Jesus is greater than your pain. Jesus is greater than your sorrow, greater than your hurt. Jesus is greater than your doubts and fear. And He can carry the load. Even casting it away. I want you to hear this. Even casting it away as far as the east is from the West. That's what it tells us in Psalm 103. I, I love that scripture because it, as far as the East is from the West, I want you to know, he didn't say as far as the North is from the South. You see, those are, those are pinned in place. That is the axis that this Earth rotates on, is the North and the South. Those are determined. But in this world, the East becomes the West, and the West becomes the East, and it never catches up with itself. <laughs> and Jesus said, I have removed all of Everything that you've ever done, everything you will do, every impure thought, every impure action, everything I have removed from you as far as the east is from the west. So give it all to Jesus. Because as the psalmist says, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Has your spirit been wounded? Has your heart been broken? Has your faith been shaken? Maybe you're in a place where the enemy has deceived you into believing that you're not worthy of anything and everything that Jesus offers you. 
Maybe you believe that, well, maybe the work's too hard, the damage is too great, the journey is too long. And I want to encourage you this morning to give it to Jesus because He is our great physician. He is our wounded healer and He is here to heal. Once you begin that process in your own life, then you too can have the heart of a wounded healer. Let's pray together. Our Father, we do thank You that we serve a God who is just not abstract, who is not out there somewhere, but who walks and talks with us each and every single day, every moment of our lives. And I, I pray, Father, that You would help us to, if we have not already, to begin that process of examining what's on the inside and allowing Your Holy Spirit access to any of those areas that need to be healed so that we can move forward in embracing others, impacting, influencing that sphere that You have given us, God. That sphere of influence that is available to us to give and share with others. God, the world needs that. We sometimes look and say, oh my God, the world is just in such a terrible place. And there are a lot of bad things going on, but God, this is the perfect time where You can use us to be wounded healers to others who need to hear a word of grace, a word of love, a word of mercy shared with them. Who knows, God, how that could change our world around us. We love You, Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for coming. God bless you.